Hello, and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, I'm absolutely stoked to have Alexander Knapp as my guest. Alexander is a global nomad who's working on the world's wickedest problems, and it's you're in for a treat. So we're going to start by exploring global problems, and then we're going to narrow it down to issues in and around running a business, running sales, and looking at how important it is um, that if you tweak one part of the system, you need to be aware of the impact on others. And uh, just fixing one bit is like putting lipstick on a pig. So on that happy note, Alexander, welcome. Thank you, Marcus. It's a pleasure to be here. Would you mind giving us 60 seconds on your history, please? Sure. I grew up in a small town uh, in Pennsylvania, in the northeast part of the U.S., and left the States as an exchange student to Germany, just as the Berlin Wall came down and the world changed. University Amongst times. It was, yeah, it was, it was the beginning of being in the right place at the right time, which has defined a lot of my uh, career. University was dotted across Europe. I was studying international relations and the law school was in Vienna, Austria. My first job was with the UN at the end of the war in Bosnia. And then uh, 11 other peacekeeping and humanitarian missions over the next 15 years. And this was field work. So I would be on the ground in Afghanistan or Iraq or Liberia or South Sudan for between four and 12 months at a time and then roll over to the next crisis. Uh, Giving your mother palpitations. No oh, oh, yes. Yeah. My family's all <laughs> still back in the, in, the, in the States wondering what the hell went wrong with me. Uh, eventually I got tired of getting malaria and shot and retired from field work to London, started my own consulting company. And we specialize in what we call wicked problems in international development and international business. Eventually the combination of Brexit, Trump and COVID forced us virtual. And now I'm considering what I want to be when I grow up. Excellent. Okay. Well, let's start with the big hairy ass question, which is what are wicked problems? Well, that's actually one of the most common questions that I get. A wicked problem, it was defined originally by a sociologist at the University of California named Horst Rittel. It can be boiled down to four characteristics. A wicked problem is a massively interdependent problem that has these four characteristics at a minimum. The first, is that whatever solution you try first is bound to fail. But that failure is going to give you data that you didn't have before, and you couldn't have gotten otherwise. Second, stakeholders to the problem differ about what the solution is. And in fact, they probably differ about what the problem is. Third, the rules of the game change as you're playing it. You started with four years and 2.5 million pounds budget. Well, now it's got to be done in two and a half and we're going to have to cut the budget by 40%. But we still have the same deadline and we want the same outputs. And finally, the fourth characteristic of a wicked problem is that ultimately there's no perfect answer. You are only ever going to get to choose between imperfect options. And the problem solving will stop when you run out of time, money, or willpower. Okay, so what are the qualities at a, um, in terms of the human beings involved in facilitating the solving of wicked problems that are required in order to be successful and effective in such a role? Well, I don't know about successful and effective, but I do know about surviving, <laughs> um, which is I guess, let's go let's go with the baseline in. The, particularly NATO military policy and training, there's a concept called VUCA, V-U-C-A. And it's a situation that's volatile, it's adapting, it's complex. Sorry, it's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's adapting. And that's a, 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 a a shorthand for a wicked problem, and particularly in a military context. But it describes business as well. It describes what we've all experienced over the last... 15, 18 months with COVID. And we're now, as one planet, we now have one 
common experience through COVID of living inside a wicked problem or a complex system that is constantly evolving, volatile, surprising. And we're finding that many of our tried and true methods or what we assume works or what has worked in the past at smaller scales, we're getting less return from that investment, diminishing returns using the linear tools that we've been familiar with. So what characterizes someone who can survive and and actually engage and influence? Uh, It's probably three things. The first is humility, recognizing that you cannot control it and you will never understand all of it. That is very hard for people who have been taught or come from cultures that emphasize how much power they have and reward that assumption. The second characteristic is probably curiosity. It's about constantly learning and being hungry for more information that may seem tangential until you find the connection between what you're working on and that new field of knowledge, because we're living in these systems. So curiosity is the second. The third, I think, is grit, perseverance. This is anything worth doing is hard. It's going to hurt. You are going to piss people off. They are going to come after you directly or indirectly. Any vested interest, and this is just a uh, an ecological and an evolutionary fact, will resist threats to its perceived continuance. And that works in ideas as well. Uh, absolutely. And in sales, what we find is the biggest competitor is the status quo. Yeah. On average, 60% of buying cycles end up in the status quo. Yeah. And if you're not ready to destabilize current preferences, demonstrate at an individual personal level why it is in their best interest to change. The ability to create points of difference that cause you to stand apart from all the other options, including the status quo and your competition, and mitigate against anticipated bias remorse, the regret and blame from making the wrong decision, then there's no chance of you making the sale. And it's interesting that a lot of the work that I'm doing at the moment seems to fit all these qualities. This is really exciting. So talk to me about the kind of projects that you have worked on. I'd love to um, get a little bit of a flavor and the scar tissue that you've picked up along the way. (laughs) Well, I'll divide into two parts, the pre-London and the post-London. The pre-London with the UN, I tended to do three things for the UN and its related agencies. In no particular order, I advanced UN missions, so... It's a podcast, so you can't see the UN beret over my left shoulder, but my dad had one of them. Yep. I was I was the one of the the first people in with a small team to actually get the lay of the land, to find office space, to hire staff, to establish the security protocols, set up communication, find housing, and begin the implementation of the UN mandate or the peace treaty as best I I and my team could, and then eventually hand it over to the medium and long-term diplomats. So mission advance was the first thing. The second thing was large-scale humanitarian logistics. So working in food aid in Darfur, in in the western part of Sudan, during that famine, working on the Boxing Day tsunami about 11 years ago, and actually having to supply about 400 islands in Indonesia with emergency supplies uh, that were coming in as I was figuring out how where these islands were. The planes were already in the air. The third thing that I did, and this was my academic background, was uh, election administration. And so if you heard about Bosnia's first post-war election, it was helping to run those. But also because I did studied international law, to design the constitutions or the electoral systems or the governance parliamentary systems that the new country after the war would have that hopefully would contribute toward a constructive direction rather than a destructive one. So that was the sort of pre-London life. Post-London, same kind of issues, same, same sectors 
but with the addition of international business. And I work primarily on strategy for global markets and strategy for global problems like climate change, like poverty, like access to clean water, and these types of of wicked problems. And on the commercial side, looking at emerging markets, because that's what a lot of these places that have been in conflict actually are for the global commercial sector. Um, And without that kind of commercial engagement on an international scale, these countries will not stabilize in the long term. Um, They have to become part of the global market and goods and services have to flow both from them and to them in a way that is sustainable for companies and those countries themselves. So we tend to work in strategy and its application. And we also, uh, the second major thing is developing tools to understand, to visualize, to explain, and to engage complex systems in politics or in business. Because our toolbox for both of those sectors, whether it's political or commercial, is primarily linear. We've got our Gantt charts. We've got our you know, Six Sigma. We've got all of these tools that actually create massive amounts of efficiency, but they do so by removing slack. And that slack is critical. And understanding that you're part of a whole is critical. So we're building quite a few new tools to be able to show and improve that. Define what you mean by slack, because um, that, that seems to be the critical missing piece that will leave complex problems uh, unsolved. Sure. I mean, I think it's something that that certainly we experienced here in the UK personally, and I think many people did around the world as well in the early months of COVID. It's about space for the unexpected in supply chains. That's the slack, the space. And right. we've gotten very good with just-in-time manufacturing. Zara, as a clothing company and designer, can move a a product address or a a shirt from the designer's table to actually delivering in two to three weeks, which is insane. But they have done that by optimizing the supply chain down to the second and being able to pivot when new designs and new trends hit the market. The problem with that is that if any one of the links in that supply chain suddenly breaks, pauses, or gets diverted, You've taken all of the buffer out of it in the name of efficiency, and you no longer have the flex to be able to still hit the target at the end. And we've done that on a planetary scale in a drive for profit, essentially, or impact in the nonprofit world without understanding that we don't control everything and we can't predict everything. And when the unexpected does happen, that slack is what would save us. I'm going to put you and a great friend of mine, Martin Lucas, together. Martin has developed a company called Gap in the Matrix. Mm -hmm. And he has turned, he's created a new form of mathematics called irrational mathematics Mm -hmm. that explains why people behave the way they do and unlocks decision making. It's genuinely breathtaking. I mean, to the point where the matrix can predict what a consumer in the GU47 postcode will spend their money on in nine months' time and how to get them there. I think the two of you will have a fascinating conversation. If there's a way you can collaborate, that would be really interesting too. Okay, so let's then take this to a practical level. Within the customer journey, most vendor organizations only pay attention to the bits they touch, and they don't really understand all the things that are going on in the background that get the customer to each point in their journey. And the individuals within uh, the organization have a tendency to see the buyer's journey only as the bit that they are involved in, which means that as a result, the experience for the customer is very often deeply deficient. 
Mm. Because as they get thrown over the wall from one department to the next, they have to start all over again. It's a bit like when you phone up customer service and you put all your details in yep. and they say, I'll just pass you on to you. And then you have to go through the whole misery it again. Yep. again and again and again. And people don't think as the customer. They think about them and what they can get from them. And what I would love to explore is how do you apply the principles of solving wicked problems to creating a great business where the customer is at the heart of everything you do? Mm -hmm. So I'll give you the principle that I think governs all of it. And it doesn't matter whether it's the Balkans 20 years, 25 years after the, the Yugoslav war, or whether it is a UK-based property investment and development company that we worked for. Those two examples flow from the same principle. Probably the most important thing about in understanding and engaging a wicked problem is you need to think differently about your actions. Instead of prioritizing doing things in the right order, instead, you need to focus on doing enough of the right things at the same time. If right. you are inside a complex system or a wicked problem, it's less about doing things in the right order. It's more about doing things at the, the doing the right things at the same time, because that customer is not only going to be on the phone to tech support, but they are going to be on the website trying to find in the, in the support forums if an answer is there. They probably have a friend or family member who also own the product. They may be considering purchase another purchase from the company of a related product or completely different product or service. And their decision-making is not based upon one single action or one single experience. Absolutely. In Martin's work, he's identified over 600 different potential influences. This is the, the, the challenge that we've got, whether it's in politics or in business at the international level, is that we were taught, at least on the, in, the, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, North America and, and Western Europe, we were taught that problem solving follows a very linear and logical path. You first gather information, you analyze the information to find the best option, you formulate a solution, and then you implement it, G-A-F-I. And over time, you move through those stages, gather, analyze, formulate, and implement, and you move from the problem space to the solution space, and that should resolve it and move forward. But that's not actually how people pro problem solve in reality when their issue is nonlinear. And our first problem is that we don't actually take the time to pause and go, do I have a linear problem? Or nonlinear problem. We've got two examples: um, one in the in the the public or political space, and one in the commercial space about how we apply this then in practice. The first example: we did work with a large UK charity that works on governance and democracy development, parliamentary process, and citizen engagement, and we were looking at the lessons learned and how effective all of the international aid was to former Yugoslavia after the war in Bosnia and, and ended in uh, 1996, 1995, 96. And so it was kind of a lessons learned thing. And we, we started by actually mapping from a systems perspective what governance in the Western Balkans, six countries in that region, looked like and what in that network diagram of 250,000 nodes and probably about... I don't know, three and a half million links between them. Where were the power nodes? Where were the disproportionately influential clusters? And by doing it from a systems perspective, we actually have the visual of this beautiful colored uh, network. We were able to find a couple of outlying clusters or pieces of information that were disproportionately important, but wouldn't come up if you had been thinking about it in a linear way. The first was actually 5.2% of the entire network about how does how well is democracy working 25 years later and billions of pounds later 
5.2% of the answer to that wicked problem was in regional air transport infrastructure. Mm. Not capital airports, but regional ones. Right. Can you get from a, a, large, a large city that isn't the capital directly to another large city in one of the other neighboring countries that isn't the capital and back in a day? Because those kind of connections facilitate not only commerce, but build relationships between people who at some point in the past had been at war. The other thing that came out of that particular analysis was a disproportionate importance for of tourism. And we looked at that and we said, what in the world? That was actually 6.6% of the entire map. And we were going, what in the world does tourism have to do with this? The, the questions we were asking were about parliaments and voting and citizens' engagement and a free media and, and so on. And up comes tourism. And the, our, the, the, the science tells us that this is real. This is a thing. What we found was that actually one of the best indicators that has been tested, um, peer-reviewed, um, but not applied to this type of, of international development was how much tourism income does a country get per year? And it correlates directly to the perceived stability and the perceived legitimacy and the the, lack of corruption in a country and its government. And so you can use tourism as an indicator for democratic health. Very interesting. I was watching a program uh, with uh, the comedian Ramesh Ranganathan Uh uh, traveling to um, Haiti. And the, you know, obviously it's the same island as Dominican Republic, yep. massively different yep. environment. You know, these people are living on a dollar a day, the wealthier ones on two, the level of endemic poverty, the level of violence um, compared with just over the, uh, the line, over the border, and the, you know, the difference in tourism levels yep. and stability. And you'd no, no one in their right mind would probably be thinking of taking their, you know, their family to Haiti, but you'd happily go to Dominican Republic. And they're literally, you know, it, it's a step over a line yeah. uh, to get to one to the other. Okay, this is really interesting. So I, I want to try and bring this into the wicked problem that I'm trying to address. And I'd love your take on this. Sure. And I, I fundamentally believe that sales is a force for good, but Milton... Satan's Lieutenant um, uh, Friedman took business down a very, very dark and wrong path Mm -hmm. about 40 years ago when he propagated the myth that every business should be uh, serving shareholder value. Yeah, exactly. And as a result, we now have investors driving utterly broken behaviors through leadership into management, into sales and marketing the sales operation has been broken up into a pin factory. So you've got marketing, you've got sales development reps, uh, cold calling and interrupting, marketing putting out 4.3 quadrillion bad digital adverts a year, billions of emails that interrupt. You then have salespeople, customer success, you've got account growth, then it feeds back into product development. Mm -hmm. And at the end of this long chain of abuse is the forgotten customer. And I look at the investors, drivers, and motivations. Then I look at how leadership is compensated and measured. The lack of runway for managers to learn their craft. You generally get tapped on the shoulder and told, Alexander, we've just fired your boss. You're now the idiot boss. Congratulations. Then salespeople who are churned and burned, they're hired for the wrong qualities. You've got customer success being put under immense pressure because sales, every company claims to be customer centric until the end of the quarter when they've got to make up their target. And so then they put immense pressure on the customer. So I I see uh, funding, leadership and management, compensation, measurement, career progression, the misnomer of training instead of learning. Mm -hmm. And All of these things are working uh, in parallel, but no one's really having the conversation about all of them. And I would love to understand, how do we map this 
in a way that will give us those insights about tourism or regional airports or our equivalents, because it's such a difficult, gnarly problem. And trying to bring this conversation to the fore uh, and get people debating it uh, when they're holding on through attachment and ego to their old habits and we don't do it this way in this company. (laughs) That sort of stuff. So I'd love your help on that. So one of the things that we, in my in my company, that we realized and what brought us together initially was a recognition that the non-linear toolbox was nearly empty. We had lots of linear tools, but business schools and primary and secondary education, the best think tanks in the world, the alleged innovation hubs make existing tools a little bit better but they tend not to take the jump and make new tools entirely, particularly informed by and believing that you're in a a complex system and you're not going to change that. So we asked ourselves, what, what could we do to visualize wicked problems better, whether it's in commerce, whether it's in, in politics, there are a few companies that are working on this. One that we partnered with is called Quid, now net base quid, QUID, just like the, the slang for the one pound piece here in the UK. And quid is a it's a it's a fascinating product that is based upon access to about last I last I I, I heard um, was about 80 different public and commercial databases. So this is everything from LexisNexis to Bloomberg to PubMed, where all the medical research gets published, to JSTOR, where all the academic journals are, to every digitized magazine and newspaper of the last 15 years, to blogs, to the public filings of the SEC and the European equivalents for public uh, public companies, and social media. So all of Twitter, all of of the Facebook that's, uh, that's publicly available. And that forms the basis in a qualitative sense. They're words for a search engine. And it's a search engine they developed that you use to build a quantitative map of a qualitative question. And so our question for the the example before in the Western Balkans was, how's democracy doing in the Western Balkans? And then we broke it down with specific keywords. We worked for the third largest property investment and property development company in the UK. Um, They came to us and said, hey, can you can you stare into your crystal ball and tell us what the future of intelligent buildings and its market is going to be? And we used this tool, Quid, and we built a, a, a query and a data set and a way of engaging with it that allowed us to ask, what is the future of? the intelligent building market, and then pull from the knowledge in those data sets and databases a picture. And it visualizes a picture. When it finds some content that matches the question, then it grabs it, it reads it with uh, AI, and then it links it to other concepts in that content and outside that content to create a visual map of the answer. To that question. It's a fascinating project. It, it's very, very innovative. But most importantly, it allows you to visualize the whole of a problem or a, the whole of a market at once and see it in human, in human ways. At that point, because it's digital and it's based on nodes and links and it's a system, you can actually begin to analyze it, slice and dice it different ways. So there are tools out there. And in this case, When we applied it to the property market, what we found was the most important part of the future intelligent building market, paradoxically, was not anything physical at all. It was not anything technological at all. The cluster of content that had disproportionate influence over the entirety of the whole market was 2.8% of the entire network. But that 2.8% was people, employees, and culture. Okay. The conclusion was that the most important part of the intelligent building market is actually the people who you put into it, 
who use and and inhabit the building, who walk past it on a daily basis, and their connections to the larger community, and as you rightly say, the customers. Very interesting. Okay, so that, what you just said, clearly depends on two crucial factors that jump out at me. One is the ability and willingness of the leadership to take the plunge Mm -hmm. and risk destabilizing the status quo and let go of what made them successful or they think made them successful. Mm -hmm. And the second is in the quality of the questions that you put into your tools in order to ensure that you're getting the true picture. So let's start with leadership, because I know this is a topic near and dear to both of our hearts. I, I see in public service, I see a dearth of quality leadership. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know in our preamble to this conversation, we talked about why you should never give power to people who want it. And you mentioned that the real uh, cream of the crop are avoiding going into public service leadership because of the grist mill that yeah. they'll have to go through and their families will be uh, subjected to. So if we were to solve that wicked problem, what's the starting point of uh, growing great leaders? No softballs here, huh? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm on an advisory panel, essentially a, a, a type of board for a, a Northern Irish Institute called um, the Institute for One World Leadership. And we're building it to answer that very question. And my belief and the belief of my colleagues who are, are part of this movement, part of this effort, is that the answer to your question is actually found in the earliest stages of our educational system. Mm. And it isn't so much about building leadership skills, though that will be a byproduct of it, but it's about teaching our children not what to think, but how to think so that they can engage with these wicked problems that that the world has, that they are going to have, no matter what the scale of their their horizon um, might be. But it's about Leadership is, is, is about being humble enough to know that you, are, you don't have all the answers, being secure, self-secure enough to be able to say, you know, I have no idea, mm-hmm. or I need help. And then finally, to realize the interconnection that we have with everyone else on the planet, because it has gotten so small, that even if it doesn't uh, seem to affect you directly in whatever your day-to-day life is, what's happening on the other side of the world. We now know, we now know that a very small thing, literally a virus, yeah. from one part of the world can bring the entire planet to a stop because of this wonderful and terrible interdependence that we have. And that makes us all responsible to some degree for how we go about making our choices and voting in our elections and choosing where we spend our money and prioritizing what we what we choose to learn on a daily basis. Hopefully we are learning on a daily basis. I, I love your optimism. I'm not entirely convinced that we are, but um yeah I know I think um someone you would love uh to uh, meet is a guy called Patrick Lindquist. Patrick is the co-chief of innovation for the city of Helsingborg. And it will not come as any surprise that um, he comes from Sweden because of the way their education system works. And the objective that they have is to make Helsingborg the center of innovation for Europe by 2023. And what's been really interesting, because I've had him on the podcast a couple of times, is how he goes about solving wicked problems. He has managers of the gap. It's, an, it's, a, it's a title where these people, their job is to bridge between the different siloed organizations or groups or communities and recognizing the interdependencies. 
when he was tackling the transport problems, he hired a team of 10 people who'd never worked in transport. Mm -hmm. They were all users of transport. And everyone was saying, you're out of your mind. But actually, it's worked beautifully. Similarly, for elder care and primary education, using technology, but also uh, thinking as the end user and working from there. So uh, again, I think I'll, I'll make an introduction to him because I think you'll really enjoy. Sounds fascinating. Uh, and it, sound, it sounds like something that we that we did as well because whether or not we consciously recognize it, the way we're taught to solve problems, this GAFI, GAFI method, this linear method, it comes out of the Industrial Revolution where we learned that we can optimize and increase profit exponentially by creating our, our production lines, our manufacturing lines. And it definitely works in linear markets and linear products. It's fantastic. But that engineering metaphor, that machine metaphor, then seeped into our social systems as well, into our language. We've got human resources. You have direct reports. You have line managers. You have all of the you know, organizational charts, not organizational ecosystems. And to try and break that in deeply ingrained habit. One of the things that we did in my company was much like you were saying about uh, this approach from Linquist was that we had a plan. We hired a cognitive neuroscientist into the company. We hired an organic chemist into the company. We had a genetic engineer and I did the quantum mechanics because all of these four sciences are about interdependent systems. They're about organic change, literally, at the most fundamental levels. They're about um, genetic adaptation, which is just a scientific word for innovation. And quantum mechanics is about probability. What is the probability of this happening? How can I increase the probability of it happening, even though I accept that I can't guarantee it's going to happen? How can I increase the probability that it will go viral? I can't force it to go viral, but I can increase the probability. And actually, those sciences, in contrast to engineering, allowed us to pull new insights. The insights allowed us to create new tools. And hopefully, the new tools, when applied to business or to politics, create better interventions and more impact because we're we're meeting the complexity on its own terms. Very, very interesting. Someone else I think that you'd really enjoy Um, speaking to is Suzanne Jacobs. She had her wake-up moment when she realized that she knew more about her laptop than her people. And uh, I had a fascinating conversation with her um, last year about the realization that, uh, uh, building on exactly what you said, that we've dehumanized the whole um, process of going to work and production. In fact, Adam Smith in Wealth yeah. of Nations, makes the point that uh, uh, creating that production line is not a good idea in the long run for precisely the reasons that you've touched on. Okay, th- this is really fascinating. If we look at the effect of only tweaking one part of the system, what are the negative unintended consequences that we can realistically expect by putting a sticking plaster on the cancer in that way? <laughs> So I think the first thing to remember is that no part of a company, no part of a market, no part of a country exists in isolation. We know that to a degree, we accept that to a degree, but we assume that we we can see all the connections. So for example, the standard organizational chart for a a company is going to have some type of a public interface unit department. It's the marketing department. It's the press relations department. It's whatever that might be. Communications department for your senator or your MP. There is then a firewall, both digitally and figuratively, between the internal structure of the organization or company and the external. And there are certain ports in that firewall to allow information back and forth. Um, We understand this, but for every employee, 
that has a mobile phone and a Twitter account, congratulations, they are double-hatted as your director of marketing. And while we can create as many standard operating procedures and the thick handbooks of employee policy and guidelines and restrictions about who can say what and when, we just had four years in of the American presidency that demonstrated what one person with a disproportionately loud voice and an international digital platform, how much damage that can do. And we've seen again and again how a rogue tweet from an employee, never mind the CEO, can completely derail an ongoing strategy or knock 20, 30% off the value of a company in a day. Mm -hmm. So the first insight is don't pretend that you see all of the connections and the links and map the second and the third level down as well as just the first. And don't use an organogram, you know, a hierarchical engineering model to do it. And so we talked to, to clients about ecosystems. We actually talk about ecorgs, E-C-O-R-G-S, ecosystemic organizations. When you've grown large enough that the hierarchical model no longer works as the best model to understand the, the workings of your, your company, an ecosystem model is much more effective and it's much more realistic, but it requires you to recognize that you do not have control over the whole of it. And actually you've preempted where I was headed. Um, which is the whole concept of command and control. (laughs) It's largely an onanistic uh, myth. You're just convincing yourself and giving yourself a stroke to think that you do. And unless you learn to give trust and unless you learn to empower people who are lower down the, uh, the food chain, then chances are you're going to not only be missing critical feedback, and insight, but you're going to be working with only an, a very, very limited view of the problem. And so one of the other issues that I see is organizations have a tendency to hire in their own image only weaker. Yeah. And I see this in the conversations I've had around diversity, equity, and inclusion, mm-hmm. that many organizations hire because they want to tick the box about being diverse and equal opportunities employer, but then they make it impossible to fit in and then they fire people for being different. Uh, As opposed to welcoming the the challenge and the difficulty. Um, So I, I think where I'm headed with this is that when you operate in a complex interdependent world, tackling wicked problems, the first thing you need is the vulnerability to admit you don't know it all. Yeah. The courage to give trust first and to empower people in a safe environment to have a voice and to take on difficult work and not just drop it because it's tough. In negotiation, what I've found is the best kind of negotiation results in a win-win outcome when neither side makes any compromises. Mm -hmm. It's about finding the common ground. So you work from that point on. So if you do have to make any compromises on either side, they're small, but both sides get their needs met eventually. And that's bloody hard work. I mean, that's, that, that, that moves from science into art. It really, really does. I, and, and I, I've seen people who can do it. And on the international scale in peace negotiations between, you know, in, participants in endemic conflict over time that has just been brutalized. And I should, I should point out that by nature, I'm a control freak. I am a command and control guy. Right. I want everything to be rational. I want to be able to come up with the perfect system that humans cannot screw up. <laughs> but I was so fortunate in a way, looking back and reflecting, that When I got to Bosnia in 1995, and then I got to Albania when that country collapsed due to a pyramid scheme run by its own government, and then when I got to Kosovo in 99, I had three wars and in three countries over five years that beat that silly command and control illusion out of my thick skull. 
It <laughs> literally, it literally, I got medevaced out of Kosovo with three bleeding ulcers due right. to stress of trying to fix Kosovo, to impose order on its capital, Pristina. And it was the best thing that could have happened to me because it took something at that scale to overcome and break my ego. And I'm so glad it happened at the beginning of my career yeah. <laughs> um, rather than at the end. And as a result, our, you know, our, the culture deck for our company, when you talk about diversity, inclusion, the, the, the differentiation of ideas and, and so on, the, one of the pages in our culture deck, it's about people and says, who are we looking for? We've learned that, and this is the quote, you can't think different if you're too busy pretending to be the same as everyone else come as you are. And we, we, we actually changed our hiring process in order to find what we affectionately and respectfully call freaks who yeah. don't fit in and create a space for them to actually use their superpowers and have, and to do so in good company. Because most of the time, those individuals of whom I am one <laughs> don't fit in well within organizations, but those organizations lose out on what magic we can bring. Really interesting. Someone else I reckon you should meet is a lady called Suzanne Schuller. She works with CEDA and she's been heavily involved in a number of conflict areas, uh, particularly creating... Swedish uh, CEDA or Canadian CEDA? British CEDA. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. So um, it's all about dispute resolution. Yep. So um, resolving and creating the detente after the uh, atrocities in Rwanda and various others. Yeah, um, very familiar. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, th- Alexander, this has been an absolute joy. Unfortunately, we've come to the top of the hour. I would love to have you back. And ideally get you onto a round table with some of the people that I've mentioned today, because I think we can kick the arse out of a number of really interesting <laughs> problems and at least um, o- open the dialogue. Tell me this, what, what are the blind spots that you've self-inflicted in the past and what did you learn from that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That could take an entire another hour or an entire another day. But well, we can do another episode. There we go. But what what, what I'll say in short, (laughs) like I said, I'm a rationalist. I I like to think that I make rational decisions. But what I've had to learn, and again, it was our neuro in-house neuroscientist that taught me this. As humans, we don't make decisions with our neocortex, which is the new brain that does the logical processing. So we make it in the back of our head in the amygdala, which is the fight or flight part of our, our brain. And then we rationalize with the neocortex what we've already decided back in the, the amygdala. Absolutely. And what I had to learn, my blind spot was I assumed everyone was going to, to act rationally, the rational actor model. What I learned was that reality is subjective in many, many ways. And if you want to get to that compromise but successful negotiation, you've got to, one, go to where people are, and you've got to start with their reality. And expecting them to come to you is 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 a, a huge mistake. I think the second blind spot, I mentioned I'm a control freak. It did take you know three ulcers in Kosovo for me to 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 get to 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 find a different way of understanding the world. And I'm really glad that that happened. Wasn't fun, but I survived. And I think the final thing is that because of the work that I've done in my personality and whatever else, I've got an independent streak a mile wide. But the older I get, the more things I realize that I am completely lousy at doing. So what I've deliberately tried to do is find and hire people who are smarter and much more capable than I am and change my focus to getting them the resources they need and then providing them cover from the bureaucratic immune response system while they do some really miraculous stuff. It, that's really interesting that you say that. I have every manager, I believe, has five functions on their job description. Hire the best people. Yep. And you never compromise on recruitment. Get the best out of them. Mm-hmm. Make sure they have the tools and resources they need to do their yep. best work every day. 
help them clear roadblocks and in particular protect them from acts of idiocy from above. Yes, exactly. And give them a voice and power them to speak their mind freely and safely. Yep. And if you do not manage like that, then what you you end up doing is getting less than. And um, a fabulous book that uh, I've been reading recently, Liz Wiseman's Multipliers, she talks about the difference between a diminisher and a multiplier manager. Mm-hmm. And the diminisher will get about 50% out of somebody. A multiplier will get 200% out of what uh, more than what they expect they're capable of. And That's we, a fourfold improvement. It is. And we, you know, uh, again, from our culture deck, and we, we, this was the thing we did on the first day of the company from the section on our mission. Why do we do this? We, we say, and I quote, there are good people out there trying to save the world in spite of itself. They're selfish, selflessly fighting a ground war against overwhelming odds and the forces of fear, mediocrity, prejudice, greed, evil, laziness, and stupidity. <laughs> we are their air support, and we're here to make sure they're not in the fight alone. And we believe that. That is bloody awesome. Yeah, that's Excellent. page six of the deck. <laughs> okay, tell me this. Yeah. Um, you've got a golden ticket. And you can go back and advise the idiot Alexander, age 23. Oh, boy. <laughs> One choice bit of advice would you give him? All right. Very simply put, first and foremost, you are not as smart or capable as you think you are. Yeah. Second, <laughs> no, really, you're not. <laughs> Third... <laughs> Refer to one and two. Yeah, that's one and two. It really <laughs> needs to be two separate ones. Third, say I don't know and ask for help far sooner than you want to. And then finally, when you're in a wicked problem, just focus on the next three things in the right direction. Because you're never going to be able to predict the fourth from where you're standing now. That's great advice. Excellent. Alexander, how can people get hold of you? Very easy. The website is akc.global. That's akc.global. If you want to see our culture deck, that's at akc.global slash opportunities. It's right on the top of the opportunities page. It's also on SlideShare. We publicize it uh, so people can see our operating manual, how we think and what we prioritize. It has the one-page employee manual with three, the three uh, employee guidelines. And I think it's a total of like 15 words or less because we do hire the right people. And if you want to email me, it is A-K-N-A-P-P, Alexander Knapp, A-K-N-A-P-P at akc.global. Excellent. So one final question then. If you were to point people towards some great content, books, audios, videos on uh, dealing with wicked problems, what would you recommend? Well, I'd recommend where I, where I started. And for the, the listeners, I'm, I spun around and grabbed a book out of my, my bookshelf directly behind my chair. It is called Birth of the Chaotic Age. That's spelled C-H-A-O-R-D-I-C. And it is by d You're holding one up, too. <laughs> 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 clearly, clearly, great minds think alike. And we've just blown a, 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 a fantastic adage out of the water. <laughs> and full seldom differ, though. Yes, exactly. It's the autobiography of D. Hawk, who's the author, and he was the first CEO and the chairman and the chairman emeritus of Visa International, the credit card company. Right. And it describes how he built the company to a trillion dollar company that didn't have a headquarters that actually worked as a complex system by defining how the different parts globally interacted with each other. These are countries so that you could buy a souvenir in Thailand using your debit card and it automatically got back to your bank account in Los Angeles. And that is a minor miracle, but it it's all based upon and a great example of the application of complex system theory into one of the biggest companies in the world. That's fabulous. I, I'm going to add to the book list which is How to Run Your Own Life by Ute Meininger, J-U-T-M-E-I-N-I-N-G-E-R. It's only available as a secondhand book. 
Mm-hmm. You'll be lucky to get it for less than a hundred pounds. Wow. It's the best hundred pounds you will ever, ever spend. Alexander, thank you so much. I can't wait to continue this conversation on future podcasts and roundtables if you're up for it. It would be a pleasure, Marcus. Thanks for the opportunity. I've really enjoyed it. So this is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you found this insightful, and if you haven't, frankly, you're dead. But if you found this insightful, helpful, inspirational, challenging, uncomfortable, then please like, comment, share, and subscribe. And tag three or four people who need to hear this message. If you're operating in a complex environment where you're dealing with wicked problems and you can recognize them from what Alexander has discussed, then make sure you listen to it with a notepad and a pen and no interruptions and listen to it several times because there are some absolute items of gold in here uh, that are not to be missed. Now, if you want to get hold of me, Marcus at laughs-last.com. And if you feel the urge and you think that the uh, podcast deserves a review, good, bad, or indifferent, then please hop across to either Apple or Google or whatever your favorite podcast is and give it an honest review. And if you want to give me negative feedback, I'm cool with that. That's how I learn. In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.